Thank you, Becky, and good evening, everybody. It's my, um, my deep honor uh, to be able to introduce to you tonight my best friend of, of nearly 40 years now, uh, Jeff Staley. Of course, the challenge of introducing someone who's been your best friend for that period of time is that you really have to leave most of the really good things out. <laughs> and Jess and I talked about that very subject a few days ago. We have, so we have a sort of a mutual non-aggression pact here tonight. Uh, I'm not going to... I'm not going to tell on him. He's not going to tell on me. But um, I met Jess Staley almost exactly 40 years ago. I had just moved to Wayne, Pennsylvania from the DC area uh, a few weeks before school began. So I knew almost nobody. Uh, so I, <clears throat> when I walked into a speech and debate class that fall and met Jess, there were two immediately remarkable things about Jess that struck me. First, he was clearly among the most popular kids in school. He had the kind of charisma that only the best politicians possess. There was an openness, a curiosity about people and ideas, a personal warmth that you just knew he wasn't faking, and that drew people to him. He would made me feel instantly that we'd known each other for years. The second thing I couldn't help but notice about Jess, after all this was a speech and debate class, was that he stuttered. He got up and he forced himself to speak in that class. It was hard to watch, and I imagined it even harder to do. I remember thinking, what courage this guy has to do this, to sign up for a debate class when you have a stutter. They say the character is destiny. Well, I can tell you, in the perspective of 40 years, that I knew all I needed to know about Jess from that first day. Nothing he has achieved in the years since has surprised me in the least. We became debate team partners and best friends. We weren't all that successful, but we had a great time. <laughs> He would come over to my house, and we'd argue politics with my father all night long. And my father, to this day, thinks of Jess as a second son. I began to notice something remarkable during the course of those early years. During our debates, during his speeches, his stutter began to disappear. In fact, I remember wondering whether he'd actually been putting it on for the girls. <laughs> Jess was always surrounded by the most attractive girls. And let's just say that I was not. <laughs> Now, I could have descri ascribed that fact to any number of Jess's unique qualities. His movie star looks, his intelligence, his infectious personality, his genuine delight in other people. But no, I told myself, it's got to be that stutter. <laughs> he turned it on and off. Argue with me, no stutter at all. Talking to a pretty girl, asking her to the prom, stutter. It melted their hearts. No question about it, I was, I was someone with stutter envy for quite a while. As time went on, though, I learned how hard he worked to frame his sentences to avoid certain words or phrases and how fearlessly he confronted his fears. That fearlessness has defined his life. It enabled him to thrive at competitive Bowdoin College and to compete for and land a job at J.P. Morgan where he dreamed of working since the days when we were reading, what color is your parachute? And he said to me, man, my parachute is green. <laughs> <laughs> At J.P. Morgan, it drove him to accept an assignment to Brazil, where he met the love of his life, his wife, Debbie. I remember Jess calling me from Brazil and telling me he was in love with a brilliant and beautiful Brazilian woman. How is your Portuguese and her English, I asked him. And he said, well, here we speak the universal language. <laughs> I guess I realized by that point that it really wasn't the stuttering. Debbie and their two daughters, Alexa and Sophia, have been the bedrock of Jess's adult life. We've been there for each other at some of the best moments of our careers. He's followed my career in law as I followed his rise to the top of the most powerful financial institution in the world. And we've been there for some of the worst moments of our lives, when Jess learned of his brother's illness, when I lost the dearest person in the world to me. But in a sense, it was all there from the start, prefigured from the moment 40 years ago in that classroom when my new friend Jess got up to speak. Well, that time has come again. Ladies and gentlemen, now as then, I'm honored to present to you my friend for life, Jess Staley. First, I'd like to thank the American Institute for Stuttering for this honor uh, tonight. 
Second, I'd like to thank Jack Welch, uh, perhaps the greatest business executive of our lifetime for sharing this evening with me. I think after tonight, I may change my resume. It may go J.P. Morgan, Blue Mountain Capital, and Big Bold shared honor with Jack Welch. <laughs> I remember when the letter B scared me. And I remember when I would do anything to try to avoid the letter W. A simple question, why, would terrify me because it was beyond my reach. And speaking in public was a very scary thing to do. As a young kid, I played trumpet because that was an easy way to express myself without speech. And then I met a teacher, uh, Conestoga High School in Wayne, Pennsylvania. Uh, she was an extraordinary woman. Um, and she decided one day that Conestoga should have a debate team. And given her proclivity to mischief and her sheer force as a teacher, she asked a lanky Irish kid who had just moved to Wayne from Washington, DC, who didn't know anybody and really didn't like to talk to anybody if he would anchor the team. He's the guy who just introduced me. And you may recognize him because John was the Attorney General during that unbelievable time of 9-11. And then the teacher did something even more silly. She asked someone who stuttered, uh, who was not comfortable speaking at all, whether I would join the lanky kid from Washington, D.C. and form the varsity debate team. And what a pair John and I were. And this teacher knew how to create chemistry, and she knew how to energize John, who didn't want to speak, and me, who couldn't speak, to lead Conestoga in all these <laughs> tournaments. My senior year, uh, this teacher went beyond that, and she suggested that I enter extemporaneous speech tournaments, because when you have these debate tournaments, they'd have next to it an extemporaneous speech tournament. And how crazy was she? So she would sit me in a room, I'd stick my hand in a bowl and pull out a piece of paper with a topic of which I knew nothing about. And then I was asked to go in front of people who I knew no one and give a speech in something uh, ad hoc. Um, but it started to work. And towards the end of my senior year, we actually started here and there to insert a sentence that began with the word, why? And I did reasonably well, back to the, what he was alluding to, you know, what judge wouldn't respond to a kid in a speech tournament who stuttered? And in many ways, it was their encouragement and the coaches um, that helped me so much. Then I went to Bowdoin College in Brunswick, Maine, which was a life-changing event for me. Now, Bowdoin has a number of extraordinarily famous graduates, not least of which is our friend Stan Druckenmiller. But perhaps the greatest graduate from Bowdoin College is a military hero named Joshua Chamberlain. Some credit uh, Joshua Chamberlain with turning the Civil War in favor of the Union Army. At Gettysburg, Chamberlain was responsible for holding the left flank uh, of the Union Army uh, against any charge that would come from the Confederates at a place called the Little Round Top. So the Confederates took a charge at the left flank. That was where they wanted to try to break down the Union Army. And Chamberlain's troops were firing away. About halfway through that first day, Chamberlain soldiers, many of them from Bowdoin College, ran out of am ammunition and had nothing left to, to fight back the Confederates who were charging on. Chamberlain, rather than giving up, yelled to all the troops, fix bannets, which they all did, and he led a charge down Little Round Top, and the Confederate line broke. And that's pretty much what turned Gettysburg. Ulysses S. Grant was so impressed by Chamberlain's courage that he asked Joshua Chamberlain to be the Union officer to accept Robert E. Lee's surrender and Robert E. Lee's sword at Appomattox. Chamberlain went on to become the president of Bowdoin College. And I'm unbelievably happy tonight to have the current president of Bowdoin College and my dear friend Barry Mills here. <laughs> What's extraordinary is that Chamberlain stuttered his entire life. And he was known to be terrified of giving a speech. But this obviously did not hold him back from being one of this country's great leaders. Stuttering is not because one lacks strength 
or courage, and Joshua Chamberlain showed that. I left, I left Bowdoin, joined J.P. Morgan, and went to Brazil, and there I met my wife, Debbie. And she has given me the greatest gifts of my life, our marriage, and our two daughters, Alexa and Sophia. Sophia, being half Brazilian and a soccer player, unfortunately or fortunately chose Brazil in the World Cup tonight as opposed to being here. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll let her go this one time. But I do have my physicist, Alexa, uh, here with me tonight. So I just want to thank my partners at Blue Mountain for their incredible support. Um, uh, I want to thank my old friends from J.P. Morgan for their incredible support, and all my friends who have showed up and contributed to this uh, evening um, and are so much a part of my life. Um, I want to finally thank my wife. I was never afraid of a W or a B with you around. And then finally, to that small English teacher who threw me on a stage and changed my life. Thank you. <laughs>